take up part of your day and uh, I'm honored to be allowed to be asked to share uh, some of the uh, the teachings that were uh, were uh, shared with me and uh, like uh, Sharice said I'm from uh, Apaskaya Cree Nation north central Manitoba on the banks of the Saskatchewan River opposite the town of La Paw and uh, I'm uh, coming to you from Ness Avenue right now in Winnipeg Manitoba and so uh, we're going to be discussing uh, the stars. But the stars we're going to be discussing are uh, not the stars uh, that everybody's most familiar with. And that's uh, going through the educational system, the Roman uh, Greek uh, mythology, and the, uh, the constellations therein. Rather, we're going to be discussing our people's uh, perspective on the sky. The first thing we should understand is that every culture in the face of the earth looked up at that sky. It wasn't uh, only Ro Romans and Greeks that had the uh, big idea of to go outside and look at the night sky. Romans and Greeks were the lucky ones who got put into the school curriculum. But everybody understood about that sky because everybody lived under that sky. And it's only common sense that uh, every culture in the face of the earth have their own connections, have their own constellations, have their own names, have their own sacred stories, their own sacred tellings, their own uh, names for, for a lot of those uh, phenomena in the sky. And the Inenio are people. Anishinaabe, Dakota, Lakota, they're no different. We each have our uh, perspective on that sky and some of them are similar. And uh, some of them are, are different because uh, they've seen the sky from different environments. They see the sky from different latitudes, different longitudes. They see the skies from, uh, from uh, different uh, seasons and uh, different um, ebbs and flows of, of the environment around them. And uh, the patterns of the animals were, were, were part of that, and the patterns of the plants, the patterns of the water. So everything tied in because it is, our people's view of uh, our reality is a holistic view. It's, uh, it includes everything, and everything um, has repercussions. Everything you do reverberates throughout, throughout our reality. It doesn't matter what it is. Even uh, this, this is what we're doing here, talking. One of the things we're always told is when we... Uh, begin to talk, we have to introduce ourselves and uh, to establish where we're from and who we are. One thing I forgot to mention is These are my relatives. And uh, I am known as uh, the dream keeper. And uh, so when, when we see these things, we're, we're uh, not only introducing ourselves to those that are, are present listening, but our, our ancestors that are out there, that has passed on this knowledge to us. We're letting them know that we're, we're going to uh, represent their knowledge as best way possible. And we're, we're telling our ancestors because we know they're with us and that uh, the, the knowledge that, that's been brought forward that uh, will be shared as uh, most honestly and uh, most, uh, most kindly as possible. And um, so this, this is uh, why we introduce ourselves in, in that way, in that manner. We're not only addressing our, the people in, that are physically in front of us, but uh, we're addressing our ancestors and letting them know that uh, we're going to do the best we know how. So, Ajagosa, the stars. The first thing we can understand is Ineño, uh, Niho, the Cree people right across uh, Canada, right across uh, the Cree people there. Uh, they stretch right from Quebec in the east all the way to uh, BC in the west and into Montana and to the Dakotas, North Dakota, South Dakota, and uh, throughout uh, all the uh, prairie provinces and uh, Quebec, Ontario, and Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta. And there are four main parts. Uh, there's the Mustachini Cree in the east. There's the, the Swampy Cree. There's the woodland Cree and there's the plains Cree, and the, those make up the four parts. And that reflects reflective of uh, our name, Inenyo. The root word for our name is Nyo, which means four. So we are the body of four, Inenyo. 
or Neoho, which is what the uh, the Plains Cree people identify themselves as. And again, it's the root word for. So that can mean that, but it can also mean uh, that when we came to this place, to this reality, that uh, we, we were given the four elements to form our bodies, which were the earth, wind, fire, and air. Those were the four elements. So those uh, are, are a couple of interpretations of, of, of the four, the body of four. So, and uh, you can apply that to any, any type of uh, lesson you want on the medicine wheel with the four quadrants. So anyways, that's a little bit of a little bit of our history as in Neo Neoho. And uh, we, we call uh, those lights in the sky Atsago Sap. Atsago Sap. And the root word is Atsak, of course, which means the stars, which means the, the spirit. Atsak is spirit. In the uh, indigenous culture, in the indigenous languages, in the Cree language, uh, I'm most familiar with uh, there's a lot of uh, ways to describe one particular thing. When we talk about spirit, there's a multitude of ways we, we, we can identify spirit. One of them is Atsak. When we talk about Atsak, we're talking about energy. Another term to use for, for that energy is Kishigurogak. Kishigurogak refers to uh, the root word is Kishigaw. Kishigaw, Tansi Kishigaw. They're asking you, how is the day? They're talking about, they're referring to that sun up in the sky, that light, that energy. So the root word for Kishigurok is Kishigaw. And so the, the interpretation of Kishigurok is uh, beings of energy, beings of light, beings of spirit. And that's what we are. We are those things. And that's what our, our basic understanding of our, our, uh, our reality is spirit. Every indigenous culture on the face of this earth originates from spirit and they understand that everything is in relation to spirit, in relation to attack, because everything is energy. And even the science, even science says that everything is energy. So our people understood about uh, those concepts of science. They, they understood the th theories that are being put forward. If we go to university and uh, we hear, we go to some of these uh, science classes and they talk about uh, things like particle theory, quantum theory. Our people operated in those assumptions. Our people operated on those theories. Our people operated in those, per those perceptions. We understood what those were. When we talk about uh, particle theory, Particle theory, theory says that the uh, energy exists and you can't uh, destroy energy. Energy, you can neither destroy nor create energy. It just changes form. And that's what we believe. We change form. We are energy. And we come to this place and we change form. We take a physical form. And then when we, when we finish our visit here with Daoski, this place we call Earth, then we go back in a, into a... Into a in, a form of energy and continue our journey. So everything is energy and everything is in constant motion. And everything is moving all the time and nothing is staying still. Right from the smallest little atom molecule up to the largest uh, galaxies out there, up to the even realities, because our people dealt with multiple realities. So it, it wasn't a simplistic understanding about our, our realities. It had a, there was a depth of knowledge to it. And every culture in the face of the earth has a depth of knowledge. Every culture has a capacity of intellectual thought, intellectual understanding. Every culture has a capacity to, uh, to theorize. Every culture ha has a capacity to, to, uh, to recognize patterns. So every culture ha had, has these things and every, every culture had their knowledge. Of, of the world around them because they lived in that in that world around them. So they had an intimate knowledge with that world. It just when the Europeans come here, they, they, they just didn't bother to ask anybody what, what people thought. And they just assumed that uh, nobody knew anything except them. And uh, you can see that in the educational system where especially uh, something like uh, astronomy. When you go to school and, and you, uh, you learn astronomy, the first thing you learn, learn is uh, uh, Ursa Major, Ursa Minor, Orion. Cassiopeia, and that's all. They don't tell you nothing else. They don't say, oh, oh here's another perspective. They don't say that. And uh, of course, m myself going through that school system, I, I naturally assumed when I heard that, that nobody else knew anything. 
other than the Romans and the Greeks and others than the, than the West, Western culture. It wasn't until I started to uh, get reintrodu reintroduced into my, uh, my ceremonies, my ceremonial circles, understandings of my people, the language of my people, that I started realizing that, hey, wait a minute, uh, there's, there's a lot being left out here. There's a lot not being said. There's a lot not being taught, especially to us as indigenous people. And uh, if this was being taught, then maybe we'd have a better feeling about who we are. Maybe we have a, we, we have a better base of understanding. And so uh, when, I, when I started uh, studying the stars, I started coming across these things and I started making connections. And I started uh, decolonizing my mind because uh, my mind has been decolonized through this educational system that I went through and uh, through all the oppression that I've, I've experienced. And I'm sure all of us have gone through that oppression. All of us have gone through that experience of being marginalized, of being dehumanized, of being uh, not looked at as a human, as uh, being uh, something uh, to be uh, put, put on the stage when, uh, whenever they want to talk about a, something indigenous. Going through uh, the educational system, uh, every, every uh, class I went to, because when I went to school in the park, I was the only indigenous person in the class because I, I, I was adopted. I was a part of the uh, child welfare system. So I went to school in town. I didn't go to school on the res. And so I was uh, only, only a brown face in that classroom. And uh, I was the instant expert on anything indigenous. And that was right through, the edu right through my educational experience. I was the, in, as soon as I walked into that classroom, I was an expert on, on anything indigenous. Anytime they wanted to talk about indigenous, all the eyes would turn towards me. And, uh, and I'm sure that's the way with, with, with everybody listening. That's the experience we had. And so through that colonization process, we'd, uh, we'd learn to, uh, I guess, one of the easiest ways to put it is to learn to uh, look at ourselves in a, in a sim very simplistic nature. And when I started going to a ceremony and I started uh, learning the songs, starting learning the ceremonies, started fasting, started sun dancing, started going to sweat lodge and all these ceremonies, I started making connections with that sky because everything is done, is done in relation to the Chigizik, that great sky. Every ceremony that's done is to honor the first one that came here. The first one that came here, her name was Atzago she was the very first one here and she came and she she became as a human being when she came here she changed from energy to a human being and then after her we followed her here everybody else followed her here and uh the story of that uh aha group that uh, star blanket it's in relation to atzago so atzago was the first one here and then everybody followed after her to come to this place. And after a, a length of time, when so many people were here, somebody had an idea, hey, why don't we honor Atzaga Sisko? Why don't we honor the star woman? And because uh, uh, when she came, she was uh, given some instructions. When she was lowered down to earth as a, as a being of energy, she was told that when she touched touched down on earth, she had to take a physical form. And then when she came, she was told that she had to uh, bring a, a gift with her. And then when she came, she told her that she couldn't stay long. They told her that she couldn't stay long. So she accepted those terms and she came down and she took a physical form, which was us. And the gift that she bought was the star blanket. But that star blanket had seven points to represent those seven stars of that place where she came from, which was Pagwangizik, the hole in the sky, which the Roman and Greeks referred to as uh, the Pleiades, the seven sisters. Uh, our people call that Pagwangizik, the hole in the sky. And the Anishinaabe call that Pagwan also, the hole in the sky. And so anyways, so she got lowered down to that hole in the sky and she came down with us with her gift, which was a star blanket the seven pointed star blanket to represent those stars that were visible in the night sky at that time. And of course, as for staying long, how long is long for a being of energy? So she stayed a lifetime. 
And we all stay a lifetime, no matter how long or how short that lifetime is, we stay a lifetime. And uh, when she got lowered down, she got lowered down by one of our relatives. Her name was Gugu Minagashis. Gugu Minagashis, his grandmother spider. And she sits on the Milky Way and she guards that doorway, that Pagungizik, that hole in the sky. Because that hole in the sky is a, is a spatial anomaly. It's a wormhole. It's a doorway to another reality. And our people dealt in multiple realities. Our people had that knowledge. And so Chagas uh, Iskreo came down from another reality to this place. And she took a physical form and she bought a gift with her and she stayed a lifetime. And every time, every one of us had come down through that hole in the sky and lowered down by a Chagas by Gugu Managasis. Gugu Managasis said a single strand of webbing which lowered Star Woman down to this place. And through her, we all come to this place. Gugu Managasis lowers us down. And that single strand of webbing we call the umbilical cord. And that's how we all get here. And we spend a lifetime here and then we leave again. And that star blanket for our people in traditional times, that star blanket was, uh, was the made for the baby when the baby came. Seven pointed star blanket were wrapped in, babies were wrapped into the blankets. And then when we were ready to go back, we finished our, our job here, our experience here. We're, again, we're wrapped in a star blanket. And uh, to remind us that we have to go back home to that place. So as uh, more and more spirits, Kichigoga came to this place and took a physical form. They decided to honor a child's skill. So they, they had the idea or the vision of uh, adding an extra point to that seven pointed star blanket. So nowadays you'll see a star blanket and it'll have eight points. And there's an extra point there to honor a Kugu Minau, a Chagosisquil, the first grandmother, star woman. And that's why we have a seven pointed star blanket for her. And it reminds us of that place, place in the sky called Bagwangizik, the hole in the sky. And we're never did worse from that place called the hole in the sky. Because when we dream, we connect, our mind connects, our spirit connects to that hole in the sky. We're told that when we sleep, we always dream. It doesn't matter if we don't remember what those dreams are. When we sleep and our body is resting, our mind rests, our mind connects to that hole in the sky and we dream. And as we dream, we, we get images of millions and millions, millions of possibilities. Infinite possibilities were given, images of us. So we're constantly dreaming. Even sometimes you can sleep and you sleep for maybe six seconds and you feel like you, you had a great big huge 30-page uh, story in, in, in that dream or maybe even a whole book in that dream and it was just uh, six seconds you went to sleep for. So these are infinite possibilities. And they tell us when we sleep that connection is made and we get glimpses of those infinite possibilities that happen. And sometimes in our waking lives, we're doing something and all of a sudden we'll stop and say, hey, I know what's going to happen next. Or, hey, I've been here before. Or, hey, I've seen this person before. And yeah, you have, because you've dreamt about them. You've dreamt about that possibility. And that's one of the possibilities that's coming to reality with you. So when they're talking about things like that, when they're talking about infinite possibilities, what they're talking about is quantum theory. And they're talking about alternate realities. And again, it's quantum theory. And these are depths of knowledge that our people understood. And they realized that dreams are very important to us in our human reality. They're not separate. They're not something subconscious. They're intertwined with our reality. Dreams guide us. Dreams give us hope. Dreams give us understanding. Dreams give us connections. Dreams give us uh, confidence. Dreams give us aha moments. moments. Moments where everything starts making sense. So dreams do all these things for us. So they can't be separate from who we are. And we have to acknowledge that, that, that spirit, that en energy that, that does that. Because as indigenous people, we have our own way of coming to knowledge. We have our own methodological process that we use. And uh, some of them are similar to the, uh, the Western science, the, uh, the scientific method. Of course, we use prior knowledge. Every, every culture, every human uses prior knowledge. And uh, we use uh, 
pattern recognition. Everybody understands pattern recognition. Again, because they live in a world that they're shrouded, totally immersed in, in that reality and they have to understand that reality. So you, you got to recognize the patterns. And once you start recognizing patterns, you can make predictions. And then you can make hypotheses with uh, all that knowledge that, that you already have. But from there, our, our methodologies start changing because we, we, we can uh, identify those things as, as being similar to uh, w Western uh, understandings. But at the base of it is Atzak, the spirit. And everything we do is operated from a spiritual perspective. Everything is based on spirit, is based on Atzak. Spirit is there. So one, one way of coming to uh, knowledge is uh, dreaming. It's very important that we dream. And it's very important that we acknowledge those dreams. Another way of coming to knowledge is fasting. We fast, again, we're, we're pulling ourselves, we're disconnecting from that reality we're in and we're slowing ourselves down and reconnecting with the spirit of the land. And when we do that, our mind becomes open to other possibilities. And then we start taking in the world around us and we start seeing the patterns that are around us. And we start making those connections and we started being empathetic to what we see and we start identifying with what we see. So those are ways of coming to knowledge. Dreaming, fasting. Another way is uh, ceremony, all the ceremony that's done. Again, we're, we're in ceremony and when we're in ceremony, we're sharing. We're sitting there sharing with other minds. Our perspectives are broadening. We're learning, we're listening, we're talking and we're, we're empathizing. So, so, so all these things broadens our perspectives and opens our mind to other possibilities. So again, we're making ourselves ready to learn. So these are, are, are other uh, ways of coming to knowledge that, uh, that West, Western science doesn't seem, to, uh, doesn't seem to value. But for our people, it's very, very important because we realize that we can't separate ourselves from our reality. I had to laugh at one of the uh, one of the elders uh, was chuckling. I was at the uh, universe, the First Nations University, and uh, I was visiting uh, visiting there, and I was uh, invited to go sit in on a science uh, a science uh, lecture. So I was sitting in a science lecture, and uh, the person giving the lecture was talking about an experiment they were doing, and how the uh, they separated themselves from that experiment. They were impassive observers, and uh, they, they 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 had tried. They said they, they, they didn't want no influence happening on what was going on. So they, they, they sort of uh, disconnected themselves and they just watched. And the elder was chuckling, and uh, and he, he said, "You can't be. There, there's no such thing as a passive observer." He said, "Because the the fact that you're existing in this reality means that." you're interacting in this reality. It doesn't matter if you're here or if you're a thousand miles away. You're, you're in this reality, you're in this plane and every molecule in your body is reacting with everything else around you. And, and uh, it, so it, it, it doesn't matter. You, the fact that you're in this reality, you're affecting something. You can't be passive about that. So th that's the holistic nature. The, the elder was just describing the holistic nature of our perspectives. And our, our reality, our presence has an influence on anything. Even uh, what we say is, uh, has an influence. So our elders always tell us, you gotta be careful. Be, be, be very careful of what you say, especially when you're, uh, there's, there's children around. Because once whatever that energy leaves your mouth and it gets into reality, then whatever you say can, can hurt and can damage and can damage a life like for, 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 for how long as a person lives. So we have to be very careful of uh, what we say, especially when the young people are around and the youth and the uh, watch this up. So we're told these things and uh, they're, 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 uh, they're very real. So these are some of our methodologies that uh, we have to get back to using and we have to start acknowledging. And uh, every human being on earth dreams and so 
every human on earth dreams. So even, even the uh, scientists in places like NASA, places like that, though they don't acknowledge it, they, they're, they're part of that reality and they're part of that dream, that dream world. And they come to knowledge that way. Even, uh, even uh, somebody like uh, Einstein come to knowledge. He had his aha moment when he had a dream. So we all come to knowledge like that, and we we, we got to start acknowledging those, those uh, important methodologies that we use. One elder told me he said that uh, he he took me out at a place called Wanaskewan outside of uh, Saskatoon. It's a heritage park, and it's real. It's really awesome place, a real spiritual place. And uh, he took me out there, and we were standing out in the plains one cold September night, looking at that night sky. And he said. If you look up at that night sky, every star you can see with the naked eye. Our people had a name for it. There were, there were stars that were connected together in constellations. And these constellations had names. These constellations had sacred stories. These constellations had patterns that we recognized. These, these constellations uh, filled the sky. And these constellations had many tellings other than just one telling. There was a lot of stories that were associated with uh, groups of stars, not only just one. And he said, due to the historical trauma that happened to our people, 85, up, up to 85% of that knowledge base was lost. We, we, were, we were traumatized into letting go of that knowledge. And uh, the elder said, uh, think of it like this. You have a village of 100 people so there's a village of 100 people, and each person in that village know one word to a 100-word song. So when you get all the people together, they sang that song of 100 words, and everybody contributed. So that represents the total knowledge base of our people, people working together and sharing that knowledge. So one morning you wake up, and 85 of them are gone, and you're left with 15 people standing around there in, in shock traumatized and they're trying to put together that reality that they knew prior to that 85% disappearing. And so that's what happened to our people. We are operating at 85% knowledge base, 20% knowledge base maybe now. And uh, we lost that sky and we lost our reality. And so we're in the process of getting that reality back. We're in the, process, in the process of reclaiming that sky. We're in the process of reclaiming our language. We're in the process of reclaiming our rights. We're in the process of reclaiming our, our, uh, our intellect, our uh, intellectual capacity. We're in, in the process of claiming our sciences. So we're in the process of doing all these things. And the elder said, but don't be, don't be scared, he said. He said, don't, and don't be disheartened because the way that knowledge was gained, those methodological steps that our people use to gain that knowledge, we still do. We still fast. We still sun dance. We still do ceremony. We still share. We still dream. We still do all these things. So that means that knowledge is waiting for us. We just got to get back at it and start doing these things again. So it's out there. So that's your job. The young people, that's your job. You got to get out there and start doing your fasting, going to your ceremony, singing your songs, and you'll make those connections with that reality, with your, your reality. And part of that is Atagosak, those stars. Atagosak, those stars up there. So if you could bring up the first picture, we'll uh, start there. Like I said, I said when I started, so this is the first uh, knowledge that's been exposed to us going up and going through the school system. This, of course, is the Roman Greek uh, understanding of the sky, and these are the constellations in our northern hemisphere sky. And uh, we acknowledge right away, we can readily identify things like the Big Dipper, part of our Ursa, Ursa Major, Ursa, and uh, the Little Dipper, Ursa Minor, and Orion and uh, Cassiopeia, the, the big W in the sky, and the Milky Way running across the sky. 
and we can identify these things. But uh, we, we don't know anything about uh, any, another perspective. And so once we start finding out about that, uh, that, that sky and the other perspective, then we start finding out about uh, our people's understanding of science, our people's uh, understanding of, uh, of things such as quantum theory, such as particle theory, because these things are all around us and we use them every day. So if you look at this map, right in the very center of this map, there's a, the Little Dipper, which they call Ursa Minor. The end star of the handle of the Little Dipper is Polaris, the North Star. And our people call that star Kiwetin. Kiwetin from the word Kiwe, as in Matigiwe. That's what they say to you when you're visiting too long. How <laughs> Matigiwe? Go home now. So that's the going home star, Kiwe Dino. Another name they have for that star is Egagaachet. Egagaachet means like it stands still because that's the only star in the sky that doesn't move. All the other stars dance around that point in the sky. In our Northern Hemisphere sky, that, that point stays still and all the other stars dance around it. So they call that Egagaachet. It's standing still. And of course, uh, so if we can get a picture of that uh, time time lapse with all the stars dancing around, if I sent you that. So there's the Big Dipper and there's the pointer stars to find the Big Dipper. So there's the time lapse picture. So that little dot right in the center there is Kiwetin, that's it. So that star stays stationary in the sky and all the other stars dance around it. So all these streaks that you see surrounding that dot there are star trails. And this is a time-lapse picture taken over a period of uh, 12 hours in our Northern Hemisphere sky. So that point right there represents North, Kiwe Tinoa. So when they were traveling at night, they find Kiwe Tin by using that, that Big Dipper and those pointer stars. And then if they wanted to go East, they turn at a right angle with their left shoulder aligned with the, with the North Star. And that means they'd be facing east. So as they did that, they faced east, they pick a landmark in front of them and then they walk towards that landmark. And every once in a while they'd stop and they'd readjust themselves with their, their shoulder and with the North Star because they knew that as we walked, human beings tend to walk in big, huge, massive circles. And uh, depending on uh, what part of your brain is uh, dominant, your right brain or your left brain, le your left-handed or right-handed, that's the big circles that you'd walk in if you didn't keep readjusting yourself. So that's how they, uh, they, they uh, navigated at night. That was one of the ways. Again, so if they wanted to go west, then they turn again and they put their right shoulder aligned with uh, Kiwetin. And they'd that means they'd be facing west. And again, they do the same thing. So those are some directional finders in the night sky. So every culture in, in the Northern Hemisphere used that star as a guide. So every culture has a name for that star. Not only Polaris and not only Kiwetin. Standing still. So the reason that star looks like it's standing still is because our Earth is tilted at a 23.5 degree angle with our northern axis pointing directly at that star. So as our Earth spins on its axis, that pinpoint in space looks like it stays stationary and all the other stars dance around it. So those are directional finders. Other simple directional finders, of course, are things like uh, the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Nighttime sky, the moon rises in the east, sets in the west. The planets rise in the east, set in the west. And if you got time to look at them, you'll notice that the planets move faster than the backdrop of stars behind them. That's, a, that's how you can identify planets. And another way you can identify planets is they don't twinkle. Planets shine steady because they're, they're shining with reflected light from the sun. So you can identify them moving across the sky. And again, they move from east to west across the sky. So again, directional finders. And another one are the stars themselves. The stars rise when it gets dark, the stars are, start rising. They're all over the sky, but as they move across the sky, they move in the east-west direction. 
So they'll move from east to west. So those, those are directional finders. And then you can look at uh, things like the Big Dipper and tell you what time it is. Look at things like uh, Orion in the winter sky. They, again, they'll tell you, and it tells you indicators of what time it is during that part of the night. So our people understood that sky very intimately and they were connected to that sky because that sky was very important. And uh, they always knew where they were. That's the thing about that, going to university, I was told about, uh, about how my people lived prior to the coming of the Europeans, how we survived on this land and uh, how we fought and all, all these things. And uh, after I, I uh, got reintroduced to the culture and I started listening to the stories and started listening to uh, some of the elders talking and uh, telling me things like, uh, one of the things the, uh, one of the elders told me was that it, was, it wasn't uncommon for people to know six or seven languages six or seven languages. On top, of that, on top of that, they knew a sign language that was universal throughout the Americas, a common sign language that everybody knew. So that tells me that people are taking time to interact here. People are taking time to, uh, if people know six or seven languages, they're taking the time to be immersed in a different culture and, and, and they're, they're paying that respect and they're, they're uh, listening to those, uh, those teachings and understanding those understandings that are given and doing those ceremonies that are done. And so that tells me if they're doing that, how can they be fighting? That's not, that doesn't make sense. If, and the people lived by the patterns of the sky, the patterns of the earth, the patterns of the plants, the patterns of the animals to survive. And there was a lot of animals to survive with a lot of plants. And so if a person, if a people lived on uh, say hunting buffalo, then that was their that was their that was their life that was their existence hunting that buffalo, uh, along with the, uh, the environment that they were, they were in at the time, and so they didn't uh, be following this buffalo and all of a sudden across the plains and all of a sudden come to some imaginary line, that that indicated the end of their territory, and stopped and said, oh I can't go any further goodbye buffalo, we'll see you hope you come back, because your family depended on that buffalo. Your community depended on that buffalo. Your nation depended on that buffalo. So you followed that buffalo wherever the buffalo went. And you ran into other people that were doing the same thing. And so you took the time to uh, understand them. And you took the time to listen because there was so much buffalo, there was no need to uh, to be uh, possessive. There was no, no need to uh, claim ownerships because everybody didn't own anything. And so those were some... Uh, perspective that uh, I always had trouble with in the university. I was always fighting my professors. They were telling me all these things about uh, how we lived. And these were white professors telling us, uh, us the native people how we lived and what we did. And to some extent that's still happening. But anyways, so there's Kiwait and the North Star. The thing about uh, our, our, our languages is that uh, there's multiple understandings for instance, if you look at uh, the east, if you bring, you could bring up that uh, Cree map, that star map. So this is a Cree star map, and on the background of this map, of map you can see the Roman Greek uh, mythology, and in the foreground you can see some of the Greek, Greek uh, Cree, in uh, Inuyamakachagosuk, the Cree stars. And uh, to the east we call Wapanuk or Pewapan. Pewapan. Wapanuk refers to the morning star, the coming dawn star, Bewapan, Wapanuk. And uh, that's not a star at all, but it's the planet Venus. Another name we have for east is uh, Sakash still. Sakash still where that sun rises. So, and then you look to the south, and in the south, uh, it's called Osawan or Osawanuk. And it refers to the color yellow, because in the south, in the summertime, and uh, just over the horizon, just as the sun comes up, there's a bright, bright star that's shining in the south, and it's yellow. So that's why we call it Osa, Osawanuk, or Osawanuk, that yellow star. But it's not a star at all, it's the planet Jupiter. 
So that's the planet and, and represents the south. And of course, another name is Apastigishiga, like uh, noon, noontime, where the sun, sun hangs highest in the sky. And then you look to the west, and Nagaapan, they call that Nagaapan. Nagaapan, the disappearing light. And it, it refers to that, uh, that star. As, as uh, that sun goes, the sun goes down, there's a star in the sky at some sometimes in 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 the, in the sky and it's the first star you see before it gets dark and that's uh, the evening star and again it's the planet venus so venus is either the morning star or it's the evening star and it all depends on which side of the sun it's on sometimes it's in front of the sun and if it's in front of the sun then that means it's uh, the last star you see as it gets light the morning star and if it's behind the sun, then it's the first star you see in the, in the nighttime as it gets dark. So Venus is either a morning star or an evening star. And another name they have for that, Pakasha Moon, Pakasha Moon, where the, uh, where the sun disappears, where it gets dark. And then, of course, North Kiwaitin. Kiwaitin, that going home place, that going home star. So with the... Uh, with the, the languages, the indigenous languages, there's uh, multiple tellings to uh, a lot of these things. And uh, so if you look at that picture there, then you can see uh, that bear. That bear is over the stars of the uh, Big Dipper. Just the Big Dipper. It doesn't include uh, the stars of Ursa Major or Ursa Minor, just the stars of the Big Dipper, Dipper themselves. And that dip, that's the bear is facing in a dip opposite direction as Ursa, Ursa Major. And the, this bear doesn't have a tail. So the head of the head and neck of that bear are the handle of the dipper and the body of the bear is the bowl of the dipper. And uh, so I, I start telling the stories, especially because uh, when I started this uh, journey of learning about the stars, uh, a lot of uh, astronomers heard, heard about what I was doing. And a lot of, uh, a lot of, uh, I guess you call them uh, am amateur astronomers. I heard of what I was doing. And these am astro am amateur astronomers, they have an organization called the uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. And they got chapters all over, in major cities all over Canada. And they have star something called star parties every summer in the dark. They, 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 gather, they gather at various uh, sites that were, which, uh, they refer to as dark sky places where there's no light that they interfere with their looking, looking at the sky. And they set up telescopes. Sometimes they set up 30, 40 telescopes out in a big field and they talk about the stars. They're at it two, three days sometimes. And so they heard about what I was doing and they invited me to go to speak. So I went to speak about uh, some of the, uh, the Cree, that's how I was, uh, the Cree stars. And uh, so I, I talked about the bear. Mr. Musqua, the, the Big Dipper. And then I talked about other stars and then I got back to the bear, but the bear this time I called the Ochik, Ochik the Fisher. And I told, I told the telling about Ochik the Fisher. And then I told more stories about the sky and then I went back to that bear and I talked about Mr. Tim, Mr. Tim the horse, again, using those same stars. And uh, somebody stopped me and said, what are, you, what are you saying here? You just told us it was the bear, and then you told it was the fisher. Now you're telling us it's the horse. What is it? I said, well, it's all those things. It's not like a Cree myth I mean, a Roman Greek mythology where Ursa Major is Ursa Major, and that's all it is. Our, our story includes uh, the holistic nature of our, our reality, and uh, things are, are, uh, are seen, not only seen from one perspective, but seen from multiple perspectives. And so you got to include everything in, in, in your reality as, as you speak. And of course, not only that, but like I was saying, culture shared. And a lot of these stories are similar throughout the cultures. And some of them are same, are, 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 are different. Like this story for the bear, the Anishinaabe tell that story about the bear. The uh, Haudenosaunee tell the story about the bear using that big dipper. The yeah, Six Sika tell another story, again, using that, uh, that, that big dipper. The Mi'kmaq people tell a story about the uh, the bear using that big dipper. So, so these stories are uh, have traveled quite a bit, and they change because they, there's the environmental uh, indicators, and uh, they use the, the the environment that that they are 
the uh, see from and the animals that are in that environment. So those, those things change. So due to the historical trauma that happened to our people, we lost all this knowledge. At one point, this whole sky was filled with stories about our reality. So now you're looking at, what you're looking at here is about uh, 13 years of research. I've done, I made this map, got, got this map commissioned about uh, four years ago. And at that point, I put up all the uh, constellations that, that I had found up to that point. So you look at those constellations and uh, some of them have, uh, are, are, uh, have layers on them. If you look at that man on the bottom there, those are the stars of Orion. And there's about three or four stories overlaid on one another there. And same with uh, the, uh, the star that it's pointing at. Their story is overlaid on that. So there are different stories about, about, about these things. So at one point, I'd like to see this whole sky filled up in, in Inuit, Chagasuk, the Cree stars. And since uh, I had this map commissioned, we found about another 12 stories, 12 uh, sacred tellings that we can add to this, this sky. Because it's an ongoing process. The more, we, the more we talk, the more we travel, the more we attend ceremony, the more we do these things, the more uh, stars that we, we, we find, the more constellations we find. This uh, upside down bird that's right on top, that's the summer thunderbird. And the summer thunderbird encompasses con uh, uh, the Roman Greek constellations of Scorpio. It encompasses the uh, uh, Ophiuchus. It encompasses uh, Libra. It's a big, huge, massive constellation. And this constellation sits right on the Milky Way. So when it's summertime, this constellation sits on the Milky Way. When the sun is going down, when it, when it gets dark, that's the first constellation you see in the summertime in the southerly direction. And if you've ever been to a Cree Sundance, the, uh, the Cree Sundance Lodge is situated where the door that we use is the southern doorway. And uh, the main, where, where the, the, the head man sits, the Sundance chief, and where the pipes are, and where all the weapon are, so those greater flags are, are, are situated on the north side. So we observe out that uh, west, that uh, southern doorway, and that's the way the people come in and out of that doorway. They, uh, they out of that sunrise lodge, they use that doorway. And uh, I was in a Saddle Lake at, a, at the one of the sundances from one of our uh, our sundance chiefs named Manu Cardinal, who has just recently passed on, made his journey back home. He invited me to that lodge, and he took me to that northern end of that lodge, and at that northern doorway there's sod cut on the ground and it's cut like a diamond. It's cut in the shape of a diamond. And uh, he said, at each point it is this, this diamond, it represents a sacred being and they're all in the sky, he said. And he said, this point here, and he pointed to the south, that's uh, the point of that southern doorway, that diamond. And he said, this is Nipinpineasu. This is that summer thunderbird. And this is pointing to that tree, but it's also pointing to that doorway. Ugamawa is 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 uh, where the where the Sundance nest is, where, where the Thunderbird nest is. But out that southern Norway, he said, there's there's a Thunderbird up in the sky. He said, I don't know what stars they are, but but there's one up there, I'm told. And he left it at that. And I thought that was very interesting. Then a couple of weeks later, I was on the phone. Somebody called me from Ohio. They were at those uh, those big huge mounds in Ohio. And uh, he sent me a picture. And in this picture, it looked like a bird. It were dots. And uh, he said, this is a, a painting from one of the rocks, a ro rock painting, a, a, a petro petroglyph. And he said, I'm told that uh, these, these dots represent stars. So this is a Thunderbird and it's up in the sky somewhere. So I think, and, and right away, my mind connected to what uh, Noah said about uh, that Thunderbird up in the sky. And then the way things fell into place later on, there was another person from uh, Nisichuyashi, Nelson House. He showed a scroll to us. It was a birch bark scroll. And on that scroll, he, it was, there was a map, but it was in syllabics. And he said, he was told that there was a star map. And he could read them if he held that 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 scroll up to the uh, sky. The stars would align with those uh, those syllabic symbols, 
and then you could read this you could read the sky so i thought that was pretty cool and anyways there was one uh, syllabic on there it was shaped like a diamond like, like a uh, triangle right angle triangle and uh I remember that picture that that guy showed me back in from uh, from Ohio, and there was th those dots of that that petro petroglyph. There was a triangle on it, like the symbol in in the in the uh, in syllabics. And then I looked at the southern sky, and in the southern sky, right above the Milky Way, there's there's a symbol like that. It's a triangle. And uh, so as I look further. I, I matched those uh, those those uh, dots to that particular area of the sky, and that's where you found the uh, summer thunderbird, because his head is like a triangle. And then all those other the other forms of that his uh, body matched those stars that, that were in that petroform. So I thought that, that petroglyph. I thought that was pretty that, pretty cool, and that's how we identified uh, the summer thunderbird, and that's the first uh, image that the sun dancers see if they if they look. And they know that the Thunderbird is there. That's the first image they see in, when it gets dark, right in the southern doorway, is, is that Pineasio. So one of the very sacred uh, birds, Pineasio. Our elders told us there were seven of them in the sky, one of our elders. And so far, I had the opportunity to find three of them. So you, still got, you guys still got lots of work to do. So, <laughs> so, so I'm going to leave it there. I'm, and uh, I'm going to... Stop it, and if you got any questions, go ahead and ask. Uh, and I'll, I'll try to answer them as best I can. Uh -huh. I'm sure we have lots. I would say, first of all, we're grateful for you. Thank you so much for um, presenting. I know Noah prepared some questions beforehand, so I'm going to pass it to Noah first. He's always got lots of questions. <laughs> Oh, wait, before you start, Noah, I want to also remind everyone watching on Facebook um, that you can put your comments in or put your questions in the comments and I'll ask them for you. Like I say, go ahead, Noah. Well, it's just so good to, to listen to you. Um, and Ken and Ask Omitin, it's, it's just, just so great. Um, I'm really looking forward to, to uh, attending more of your um, te uh, teepees and telescopes gatherings like I, I missed it this year but I know they're just awesome um but I just it was um one of my questions is uh just if you had any stories about when you were um kind of uh awakening to the the intellectual depth and theory uh in in the new Achagosuk stories like when you if there was any people in particular that you thought really changed you in, in appreciating and seeking out all this uh, information uh, and just what it felt like to, to kind of um, to start to, to learn all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, well, it was, uh, like I said, when I connect, started connecting to the, uh, to the ceremonies and I started connecting to uh, some of the elders and started working with some of the elders, there was a lot of elders that uh, come to mind, like uh, Don Cardinal is one of the elders that uh, that sort of pushed me along because uh, at that point I was uh, sort of humming and hawing and uh, not wanting to take up the responsibility that uh, was shown me. And he told me that he said, you know, what are you going to do? I'm not going to live forever, he said. And uh, it's time that you escapes, you uh, take up that uh, responsibility because we're going to be gone and somebody's got to do it. So it's your job. So, so I started, started learning, learning about that, about uh, those, uh, those secret stories and taking up that responsibilities of those ceremonies. And through that, just learning more. When I started this journey, I started with one story. And that story was about uh, the, the Dipper. And it was about uh, Uchik the Fisher. And that was given to me, uh, that was uh, related to us by a, a, an elder named Myrtle Scribe from Kinesiao CEP, which is a uh, Norway house. And he shared that story about, about, that's the very first story I've ever heard about the Cree sky. And it connected, it made a connection for me. And I kept it for a long time. And then uh, slowly, I, I was up in uh, Nisitriyashi one time. I got hired on by Manitoba First Nations Resource Center as a, as a uh, science facilitator 
my job was to put First Nation perspective in the sciences. So we worked with 55 banner operated schools and one of them was in Nisitriyashi. So I was up there with a portable planetarium and I, at that time I had maybe one or two stories about the sky. And I was showing the kids that and the kids were really liking it and they were going home and they were talking to their parents and their grandparents and telling everybody about, about this guy at the school which was talking about the stars. And so the elders, uh, they heard about that and uh, they decided they wanted to come and see. And so one night they... Uh, they asked the principal to open up the, the school and then uh, the gym. And uh, they asked for me to set up the planetarium because they wanted to come and see. And so I did that and I, and I was all nervous. I was all scared. I said, oh, well, I'm going to get shit now. I said, uh, and so they showed up and uh, so uh, and uh, they went in and I, I, sh I showed them what, what I had up to that point. And then uh, after uh, it was done, they left and one of them stayed behind and uh, he came up to me and he said, you know, what you're doing there, you got to keep doing. Because what you're doing there is you're showing the kids the connections to our reality. You're showing the, you're showing the kids their history. You're showing the kids their, their knowledge. You're showing the, the kids their culture. You're showing the kids their ceremony. You're showing the kids all these things. And they're not getting that in school. You got to keep doing this. And he said, don't worry. If you're not meant to do this, then things will happen. He said, but if you're meant to do this, things will be put in your place. People will be put in your place. And you won't have to work hard to get these things. They'll come to you. And that's what happened. They didn't have to work hard to get these things. They came to me. They came to me through ceremony, through dreams, through people sharing, through me going through all those methodological processes that we went through to gain that knowledge. They, they, they've come. And, uh, so I, I realized, yeah, so I, I have a responsibility to, uh, to do this. And uh, somebody else will, will, uh, will step up because I'm, uh, I'm getting old now. So somebody else has got to take over. Well, I'm so thankful that you're, you're tending, the, tending the fire for <laughs> this wonderful <laughs> thing. Oh, well, yeah. And, and the teepees and telescopes. Uh, we had uh, Sixika people from uh, teepees and telescopes this past uh, October. And we had a Yaki person from uh, from uh, Southern States, and he sh they all shared the same story about uh, they used the Big Dipper. So, so the people attending, they saw they heard of, uh, four perspectives on that. Those just one group of stars from our people's perspectives. That that was pretty cool. And the Sixika people asked if they could host the uh, TPs and telescopes next next September in their territory. And I just last week I was over there. And they picked the site. So we went and did ceremony at that site to bless it. So next September 23rd, 24th, and 25th, that's where TPs and telescopes is going to be out in the mountains. Oh, awesome. right on. I was there. Um, I was there this year on the last day. So I was able to hear some yeah. of that. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. I hope I can make the next one too. Oh, yeah, Sounds like a road that. trip. Hey, they got dorms over there at that site. <laughs> if you get there early, you can be able to stay in the dorm. Mm -hmm. well, they're, going to be, they're going to be setting up about 12 teepees, they said. Cool. So right nice. Well, we're over time now. I just have one last question. Um, if you have any advice for people who are starting to connect with a Chagusak, do you have any advice for those people who are starting to do that work? Yes, you have to go outside and you have to familiarize with the stars. That's mm -hmm. what you have to do. Because right now we divorce ourselves from that sky. We're too busy in our, in our little world with all the distractions, walking around with the horn in front of our faces like this all the time. We're looking at screens and we have to uh, get away from that. And uh, if you want to look at uh, a screen, get, go find yourself a portable planetarium or go, go inside a big, huge uh, planetarium and study that sky. Because you got to be familiarized with yourself with the sky. And once you do that, you'll start seeing the patterns and you start recognizing things. Then you'll start making connections and then go to ceremony, fast, dream, all those things. Do all those methodologies that our people did to regain, to have that knowledge. So you got to reclaim that knowledge. 